So if they have astronomy in Middle Earth, do they also have astrology? And if so, are dragons a fire sign? Hi, I'm Mike Siegel. I'm an astrophysicist. I write for Ordinary Times, and this is The Throughput. So I hope you all had a wonderful holiday and are having a great 2023 so far. One of the things I used to do around Christmas time when I was younger was read through Lord of the Rings. I probably read the, the book half a dozen times at least. It just seemed appropriate around Christmas time to read it. I don't have time as an adult anymore to read it every year, but I do usually like to watch the movies. And while I was re-watching the movies recently, I saw a scene that uh, actually had a little bit of astronomy in it, and it gave me a great excuse to talk about the astronomy in Lord of the Rings. What? Astronomy in Lord of the Rings? Absolutely. Let's get to it. I'm going to put that on the back burner a second to uh, talk a little bit more in general about Lord of the Rings. And for th this, I'm actually going to go to uh, the original source material. So if you're if, if uh, you're just interested in the movies, might want to skip over that. But it's actually kind of interesting. One of the things that astronomy was most important for in the ancient world was timekeeping. How do we keep time before we had clocks? Before we had watches? Before we had cell phones that would give us annoying reminders of when we had appointments? Well, we humans live in a giant clock. We have a sun that circles the earth every 24 hours, and you can divide the day up into arcs that it's making across the sky. That's the source of hours in the full day. There are a variety of instruments that allow us to measure the position of the sun that accurately to get time. But the one you're probably most familiar with is a sundial, which uses the light of the sun to create a shadow that allows you to have a clock. Uh, the days of the week were named after the seven astronomical bodies, the sun, the moon, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn. If you are familiar with romance languages like Spanish, the connection between the days of the week and the planets are a little more obvious since they still retain uh, some of that connection in the language, but they were named after those. So that was how you divided up a little longer area of time and a month you have a moon which circles the earth and goes through a cycle of phases every 28 days or 29 days going from completely dark to completely illuminated to completely dark. That gives you a month. And for a long time, months were based on the lunar cycle. And in fact, in the Islamic and Jewish faiths, they still are. Uh, Jewish and Islamic holidays happen on certain uh, moon phases uh, that determine the calendar. Now, to make it match up with the year, which is the 365 and a quarter days that the sun takes to move around the sky back to the same constellation in the zodiac that it started, uh, you have to be a little bit creative because 29 and a half, 30 days won't divide evenly into 365 days. If you have 12 lunar months, you're going to get 350 some odd days. You're going to have about a week left over. In the Jewish faith, this is done by adding a leap month, an extra month, every seven out of 19 years or so. And that keeps the holidays roughly lined up. So Passover is always in the spring. Rosh Hashanah is always in the fall, etc. Uh, many ancient societies did use much more longer uh, periods of lunar cycles to go through so that we keep the dates kind of roughly aligned. In the ancient Roman and Greek worlds, they would add, similar to what the Jewish faith does now, an intercalary month every four years to get their lunar cycle and the solar cycle better aligned. And they would put an extra month between February and March. <laughs> oh, lousy March <smart> weather. <laughs> As time went on, of course, the need to connect the calendar directly to the lunar cycle kind of faded, but the need to connect it directly to the solar cycle remained. So we got a variety of calendars that tried to be a little bit more mathematically rigorous rather than directly connected to the lunar cycle. Now, if you look in the appendices of Lord of the Rings, you will find the Shire calendar. And the Shire calendar is really interesting because it has 12 months of 30 days and then these extra days of midsummer and Yule that 
round things out to an even 365 days for a year. Many ancient calendars did that. They had 12 months of 30 or 31 days, and then they would have an extra day in there that was kind of a holiday to sort of bridge the gap and uh, make the year complete so that May 1st always happened at the same time, same season every year. Now, Julius Caesar implemented what we would call a modern calendar, the Julian calendar, where you have 12 months of 30, 31 days, except for poor February, it only has 28. And then that gives you 365 days. So you get to the point where the sun is almost in the same place at the end of the year, but you're a quarter day off. And so you wait a year, now you're a half day off. You wait a year, now you're three quarters of a day off. You wait another year, now you're a full day off. You add a leap day, and now you're back to the same place where the dates align precisely with where the sun is in the sky again. Uh, there had to be some later changes by Gregory for making it so that you don't do it every century, but you do do it every 400 years to keep that alignment really precise over the centuries. But that was uh, roughly consistent. What the hobbits are using, what is used in Lord of the Rings, is this calendar that was very consistent with what was done before the Julian reforms. And it's, I think, very interesting research. I mean, Tolkien was a professor. He researched the heck out of these books. And very interesting that he got the astronomy right. What's more, if you've read the books, this doesn't show up as much in the movies because the movies are more action-oriented. They're you're sort of moving the plot very rapidly and so forth. They don't take their time the way the books do. But what's really interesting is the books show this, where they use the moon as a timepiece. Tolkien, if you've read any of the writings of Christopher Tolkien about how his father wrote the books, he wanted to be very precise in the chronology. And in fact, in the appendix, there's a day-to-day -day chronology of what's going on in the books when things happened. And one of the ways he kept those synchronized was the moon. There's a point where Frodo and Pippin are both looking at the full moon. And so you get that connection that this is happening at the same time. There's another scene where Sam is in Lothlorien and he looks up at the moon and based on its phase, realizes that he spent way more time in Lothlorien than he thought, that he sort of lost track of time being in this elvish paradise. And it's a really nice thing. So throughout the book, there are these just wonderful little things, these throwaways to astronomy, because you're writing about old civilizations. Astronomy was very important. It wasn't this thing about distant stars and galaxies. It was a very practical, hands-on thing to know the time of the year, to know the time of the day, to keep track of things. And so having that in the books adds that sort of verisimilitude. And uh, you don't get that much in the movies because they're moving at a much faster pace. I love the movies, but they're different from the books. Now, to connect to this movie scene, one of the things that shows up in... Lord of the Rings, is that many of the peoples have a fascination with the stars in the heavens. Osgiliath was the city of the stars. The elves are very fascinated with the stars. The dwarves have this moon writing, of course, that's on this map that can only be seen by the light of the same moon in which they were written. And of course, the door is only going to open on Durin's Day, which is when the last moon of autumn and the sun are in the sky at the same time. Now, they've changed this a little bit for the movie. In the book, the last light, the setting sun shines on the keyhole and the keyhole opens. In the movie, it's the sunlight reflecting off the moon onto the rock that causes it to open. Would people of that time have appreciated that the moon reflected sunlight? Yes, they would have. Let us say that this baseball is the moon and this flashlight is the sun. Right now, you're seeing this moon in a quarter phase. Now you're gonna be seeing it new with the sun behind it. Now you're gonna be seeing it full with the sun in front of it. As the sun and moon move relative to each other, the phase changes. Now watch what happens here. <gasps> the moon disappeared. Of course, you can see it disappeared because my big fat head got in the way. For ancient astronomers, eclipses weren't just spectacular events. They were world changing. They changed how they thought about our cosmos because they realized several things. First of all, they realized based on the alignment of the sun and the earth and the moon, that what they were seeing was the shadow of the earth passing over the moon. That made them realize one, that the earth was round. They could see that the shadow of the moon earth was circular and that meant that the earth was. And because the Greeks valued spheres as a perfect solid, they formulated the theory that the Earth was a sphere. And of course, there's Eratosthenes in a very elegant experiment, which I've linked to up here, they measured the size of the Earth very accurately. 
but it also showed that the moon did not generate its own light. It was reflecting sunlight. This was, you know, 2,500 years ago that people made this revelation about the nature of the moon, the nature of eclipses, the nature of the earth, etc., etc. Would the dwarves know this and be able to have this little extra trick in there where the keyhole is illuminated not by the direct light of the sun, but by the reflected light of the sun off of the moon? Absolutely. Given the technology, given the fascination, given that we have astronomical-based calendars, as Tolkien himself confirmed, that you would have astronomers in the various civilizations around Middle-earth, given the fascination that the dwarves and the elves and men and hobbits show for the heavens, I think it's absolutely likely that this would have been realized and that people who are educated, like Bilbo and Thorin, would know this, and therefore this piece of knowledge would be there to, uh, to have this extra little bit of security. Now, I actually don't particularly care for this change. I think it just adds a little bit of needless drama where the dwarves, for some reason, just give up their quest because the door didn't open right away and so forth. It's one of those little touches in the, in the movie I, that kind of, I think, uh, wasn't really necessary. But as far as the astronomy goes, the astronomy is fine. I think this is very consistent with what we see in the books and what we see in the movies for the kind of astronomical knowledge that is present in Middle Earth. And, uh, and just a, a really wonderful touch. And, in a nice touch, the moon is in a crescent phase in that part of the sky setting towards the sun, which is accurate. A lot of the times, the position of the sun, the position of the moon, and the phase of the moon are inconsistent movies. They actually got it right in this one. So a nice little touch. So I, I realize no one goes to a Lord of the Rings movies for the astronomy. But again, if you're writing about civilizations that are thousands of years old, if you're writing a sword and sorcery epic high fantasy like this, I think it behooves you to have astronomy as part of the texture of these stories and to get it right. Tolkien got it right in the books. They got it right in the movies. I appreciate that. So uh, I've, again, preparing a, a few more videos for you. Uh, hopefully we'll get them up in the next few weeks. Until then, I'm Mike Siegel. I write for Ordinary Times. Thank you for watching.